So this is a talk on high-performance Drupal, and it's, uh, it's interesting. I've, I've wanted to do a talk on performance in Drupal for many years, but I've done like a lot of other things, but never anything relating to performance at all. And in fact, I started writing a book called High-Performance Drupal, and I had an outline and a couple initial chapters done, and then as I was about to start working on publishing that on LeanPub, I noticed somebody released a book called High Performance Drupal. Uh, so I gave up that project because that book was a pretty good summary. It's actually um, just came out last year. It's, a, it's by O'Reilly. Well, it's not by O'Reilly, but it's published by O'Reilly. It's a good book. Uh, a lot of the stuff in this presentation is summarized and then detailed further in this book. So I'd recommend you get this if you're at all interested. Also, all the slides that I'm going to go through are already on the page on the Drupal Camp site. So if you want to go there and follow through there, otherwise there's plenty of signs, plenty of uh, screens through here that you can see it. Um, I am Gearling Guy on Drupal.org and GitHub and wherever else. Uh, I work for Acquia. That's my main primary job. But for the past six or seven years, I've run some services through Midwestern Mac, which is my little... LLC that I do side projects and fun projects on. And uh, one of the latest things I've been working on is a book, Ansible for DevOps, which talks about uh, managing server infrastructure using Ansible. So if you're interested in that aspect of things, which is very important for high performance in Drupal, uh, I, I think at the end of this presentation there's a link to get 50% off if you're interested in that book. It's a good introduction. Uh, but that's me. Enough about me, though. Um, this presentation, one reason you're all here is because it's the only presentation in this time slot. Uh, but another reason a couple of you might be here is because you've heard this rumor that Drupal is so slow. Um, and I saw this GIF a few weeks ago, and I thought it would be perfect for this slide because uh, it's just like a lazy, lounging turtle, and that's how I think a lot of people think of Drupal. It gets things done, and it's a massive, big behemoth, but it's so slow in getting there. <clears throat> but as I was working on the presentation... I came to this interesting realization that a lot of people think Drupal is slow because they come into something that's this big, massive behemoth. And in a previous presentation, there was a picture of this massive machine that did thousands of things. And that's a lot of times where people come into Drupal. But if you actually take Drupal core and install it and run a very simple site with a few simple content types, Drupal is not that slow. Uh, and in fact, when I was making this presentation, I was like, I need to have a few things that are really slow and make the site not work that well. And it actually took a lot of thought to make Drupal slow. So what makes a site slow? We're going to attack some of those kind of things uh, in this presentation and ways that you can avoid them or fix them after the fact. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to talk about three different things. Uh, first is a process, because performance, um, no matter what kind of site you run, even if it's a little blog with one content type, or a massive site with dozens or hundreds or thousands of content types, uh, if you don't have a process for making your site perform better, then you might as well not try making it perform better, because process is important. Um, after talking about what the process is that we're going to use, we'll, get, we'll run through some easy wins for front-end and back-end performance, things that are high impact uh, with very low or minimal effort. And then finally, uh, depending on how much time we get, we'll get further and deeper into it. But we're going to take a live site that's not running that well, and we're going to make it run really well by the end of this presentation. Uh, so all that in 45 minutes. <laughs> so for a process, the most important thing I would say is to have a plan for your performance. What, do you, what is your target? Um, a lot of the sites that I've worked with uh, are in industries where performance does make an impact on the business's bottom line. Amazon, everybody points to their study that they did where something like 10 or 30 milliseconds of load time made a perceivable impact on purchases made on the site. Uh, so it is an important thing, especially if you're in business selling things online or if you're in an event space where people are registering for tickets or getting information about something. If your site performs poorly, a percentage of users will abandon your site. And, um, and, you know, and even in more mundane fields, like if you have a business site uh, that internal stakeholders need to use to, to get something for your organization. If your site takes six or seven seconds to load a page, people get frustrated with it. They're not going to go to your site. They're going to start going around your site to get done what they need to get done. Uh, so performance is important for everybody. It's especially important when it impacts the money that comes into your organization. 
So a lot of people have, have a plan like the front page should load in less than two seconds for anonymous users. That plan, that one sentence has all the details that we need to have a good performance strategy for a certain page on a site. And it's good to have it this kind of distilled. It's the front page, there's a time limit, uh, and it's should, it, it's not must because there could be co certain conditions that that doesn't happen. And we also identify for anonymous users. It's important to distinguish what group of people uh, the performance should, should be working like uh, for those people. So also there's another, a little even further detail, time to first byte. This is when somebody gets a response from your server. It should be less than 500 milliseconds. Uh, that's another important kind of idea for a plan. That means that your server, your Drupal server, whatever web server it's running on, should be responding within that much time, or whatever server is running the, the caching for your site. And, um, and these two goals should be achievable by most any Drupal site out there. For anonymous users, uh, if you can't achieve these, then you need to, to take a look at some of the easy wins that I have later. You'll be able to get there pretty quick. The problem is that a lot of people approach performance kind of like the Joker. Do I really look like a guy with a plan? You know, he, uh, in the movie, he kind of just goes around and, and creates anarchy. That's a lot of times what people come into performance projects with. They're like, hey, I heard that we can put in Nginx and everything, everything's going to be better then. It might actually be worse. Or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to replace MySQL with MariaDB. If you don't know what that's actually doing, it's, it's not a good idea. You should stick to the basics and improve on them and then uh, work on an iterative plan. Uh, so part of the process after you have a plan is you need to have benchmarks. And a lot of people, surprisingly, uh, will go into a performance project and they'll do something and they won't benchmark a before and after, so they have no comparison. It's like, it feels faster, sure, but, but did you actually improve anything? Maybe, maybe not. Did something else actually get worse? You don't know because you didn't benchmark it. So make sure that you benchmark at least um, a few of these things. Like if, you're, if your site's mostly used by anonymous users, has a lot of front-end interaction, or is used by mobile users, you need to benchmark things like the time to first byte, basically when your, when your server first responds to a request, a full page load, because that's what end users are going to do. So don't just benchmark Drupal. You need to benchmark the whole thing. Uh, and then benchmark when the DOM is complete, basically, when the page renders. And then you can get, have some numbers to compare uh, over time. So you want to measure these things and measure them over time. If you're just doing one little project, you can, you can take a look today and then after you finish your changes. But it's also nice to be able to have a, you know, if you can have a graph of how are you doing this year? Have you been getting better or worse in these things? And um, when, whenever I'm approaching any improvement to performance, I want to stay in an area where it's low difficulty, something that's simple to do, uh, but makes a big impact. Because there's an awful lot, especially I work a lot in infrastructure, and there are hundreds, probably thousands of settings you can tweak in MySQL and, and Apache and PHP and all these different servers. You can add extra little caching layers. You can do a lot to save two milliseconds. But what if there's one change that saves three seconds? That's many, many or orders of magnitude difference. Uh, so you want to focus on this area. If you focus on this and you've hit like every single goal in here, then you can start looking in the middle range. But what a lot of people end up doing, especially if you read blog posts about here's how to make Nginx faster, you end up focusing a lot in this little area. There's these little settings that make almost no difference and usually make no difference or a worse difference for smaller sites. Uh, you end up tweaking these little settings that do nothing, and they give you either no or a negative performance impact. So don't do that. Focus on the, uh, the easy wins. And then once you finish all of those easy wins, which I've personally never seen happen, nobody's ever hit all of the easy wins, you can start focusing on the middle ground, but avoid the red area, unless you're hosting Google or Facebook or something like that, then those wins actually give you some monetary benefits. So uh, these are some of the tools that I use, um, and most people use a similar set of tools. There's other tools out there for performance testing, uh, but a lot of times, even just opening up Chrome, Firefox also has pretty decent network tools. Um, the Firefox Developer Edition has a pretty good little network tab nowadays. Uh, but these developer tools give you some of the numbers that are somewhat the most important. Uh, they give you time to first byte as an end user. They give you 
um, the, the content loaded from your server, and then they give you how long it takes to do everything and have the full page load complete. Those are three of the most important numbers for an end user. And then taking that further, there's also a web page test, which web page test and GT metrics, these two are some, a couple of my favorites for giving you the same kind of numbers, but from different regions. Uh, especially if your site is like a national or international site, you can measure the performance in different places because if your server's here in St. Louis and you're in St. Louis, you're probably not going to have that big of a performance issue with certain things. But sometimes if your server is, say, in New York and your users are in L.A., you're actually going to have problems due to the geographical distance uh, that can be solved with some other tools that I'll talk about. Um, also, there's a simple Pingdom website speed test. That's a nice one. And then on your computer locally, you can use Devel uh, and Drush and, of course, Chrome Developer Tools and uh, Apache Bench and then WRK, which I forget what that stands for, like worker or something. Uh, it's like Apache Bench, but easier to use and a little nicer. And then there's JMeter, which is like the super Porsche car with lots of options but takes forever to figure out. But it can be useful for certain circumstances. Um, but as I said earlier, we want to focus mostly on that green area. Uh, there are things that can make your site's performance get 3,000 times faster. We want to focus on those things first, and then focus on the things that get it 200 times faster, and then the things that get it 10 times faster, and then maybe someday you can focus on those things that give you a percentage or two. Those things don't really matter in the long term, unless, of course, you're Google or Facebook. So. Uh, let's run through some easy ones. These are things, and it, like I said, all these slides are online, so don't, don't type them out. Uh, just go online, copy and paste if you need to. Um, the main thing, really, uh, for a lot of smaller sites especially, a lot of bigger sites have figured this out already, uh, but this, this not only applies to performance, it applies to usability, uh, it applies to mobile friendliness, all these things. Keep your site simple and be ruthless about it not only in terms of what modules you use, so you don't need to have 17 little social widget modules and 17 UI modification modules. Can't count the number of sites I've seen that use panels, context, uh, some sort of block reimagined system, uh, plus panelizer and, and all these other and paragraphs and all these all on one site. Like all of those are great tools, but not all together. That's a horrible idea. Especially if you have like a view inside a panel, inside a block, inside a, another panel or something like that. that that happens. Uh, don't be that site. If you are that site, rework your content, uh, remove as many of those modules as you can, and, and make it simpler. The other thing that I wanted to point out with that is uh, our previous session talked about content strategy, and Ken said a funny thing about if your content's good enough, you don't need search. Uh, you know, similarly, if your content is good enough, you can fix performance problems by making it so that instead of three things people need to do, they only need to do one thing on your site. If you can take a form that takes three or four page loads and turn it into one page load and make the form simpler, you'll have more success with the form and you'll save three page loads per form. Uh, so that, that is a way through not even tweaking your server config or your Drupal configuration to make your site perform better. If there's less page loads, you don't have to serve as many page loads. Um, and, and, and on a more practical level, the more modules you have enabled, the longer it takes to load your site, especially if a lot of the modules are poorly written or have bad database queries, that kind of thing. It makes a big difference in, in doing things like cache clearing and, and stuff like that. It's a lot slower the more modules you have. If you have more than 100 modules, you better have a good reason for it. Um, there's a lot of sites out there with hundreds of modules that maybe use about 40 or 50. And a lot of times it's just they were playing around with the module and they never turned it off. Try to avoid doing that. Um, another thing is, uh, if you are on a shared server, or if you're on a small server, or even, I mean, no matter what service you're on, if you don't have any kind of page caching, like Varnish or Nginx, a lot of platforms nowadays build these in. But if you don't have that, just enable the boost module if you have anonymous traffic, and it'll help quite a bit. Um, it's, an, it's an order of magnitude win there. Another one is disabling the database log. Uh, any time that there's any kind of error on your site or if somebody logs in or does any of that kind of stuff, it writes to the database and slows things down. If you have a high traffic site, uh, that's not good. So disable that and enable the syslog module instead. Um, if you have a really, really low traffic site, not the end of the world to have it enabled, but it's, it's a small thing that gives you a decent gain in performance in many situations. And 
as everybody says in all of the presentations on Drupal performance, caching is caching is king. I can say that. that that's not. Uh, Ken was mentioning that content is king is a cliche. It's dated, but I can say caching is king because nobody says that yet. Um, for Drupal, there's it's like caching all the way down, and in Drupal eight, it's even more. Like now, there's like little granular caches everywhere. Which, uh, which is a blessing and a curse. It adds a little complexity, but the gains in performance that you get are huge. Uh, so these are some things that you, basically any Drupal site, there's very few exceptions, should have anonymous page cache turned on. And in fact, that's the default in Drupal 8 now. In Drupal 7, some people have forgotten to check the box, and that makes your site perform way worse. Uh, so do that. Uh, views caching, again, since it's not enabled by default, most people don't use it. Uh, but there's a module called Views Cache Bully that tells you, like, hey, this view doesn't have caching. That's a bad thing. Turn it on. Even if it's just five minutes caching, a lot of sites can per perform a lot better using that. Another thing is there's a light pager module for views. Um, every time you load a view with tons and tons of records in it, like if you're showing all your users and you have 100,000 users, uh, Views does a query to get all the data and then does another query to count all the data. And that uh, that second query can sometimes double the time that it takes to load that view on your page. So um, unless you absolutely need to have a count of all the records in your view, don't do it and use the light pager module. Um, also, add a pager to your views. I've seen some sites where they have a view that shows every item, and then that could be like 300,000 things or something, and the page takes 30 seconds or 40 seconds or five minutes to load. That's bad. Um, so use a pager on your views. Also, there's caching for panels, caching for blocks. Uh, entity cache uh, lets you cache entities. That one is a little, little more advanced, so it's not as easy a win. I was debating including that on here. Uh, but panels, if you use panels, use the panels cache. It's just like views. Even if it's just a five-minute or ten-minute cache, that can save your site sometimes. Um, another thing is I maintain the Honeypot module, so I know this uh, very well. Um, there are certain modules like Honeypot which do turn off all caching on any page where a honeypot uh, form is enabled. So if you have a login form on your home page, cache is enabled or cache is disabled on your home page. So be careful of that. Uh, there are certain modules that give you a lot of benefits, like Honeypot can protect you from spam, but if you use it unwisely, it can also kill your site. So be careful of that. Uh, so and then these are ones that I was debating adding at all, but they're still almost always a good idea. Uh, one is in settings.php, make sure that Drupal Fast 404 is uncommented. And then for certain modules, you might also need to make a couple other little modifications. But that will take most of the 404 traffic. So like if somebody's requesting an image that's not actually on your site, by default, Drupal is going to load your whole Drupal site just to say, 404, this error, this file doesn't exist. And that can soak up a lot of resources. So and it, uh, uncomment that. And if you have a little time to configure it, enable the fast 404 module. Uh, that can also help save a lot of requests for 404s on your site. Another thing that's a little bit debatable in terms of the convenience trade-off versus the performance, but uh, try to not do redirects inside of Drupal. So the redirect module is enabled on almost every site <coughs> that I own uh, because it's so convenient to be able to say, there's this page that was on my old site, and I want to redirect to here. And I can just go in the interface and click, 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 done. But every one of those redirects has to load up all of Drupal just to send the user to another page, which loads up Drupal again. That's not very efficient. So if there's things like if you're redirecting one whole folder to another folder or something like that, try to do it on your web server in the web server configuration, like your HT access file in Apache uh, or in your configuration. Also, uh, another one that's, that's fun sometimes, if you ever visit a Drupal site uh, this happens a lot on like community sites, and in fact, I, the reason why I put this on was because when I was working on this campsite, one time I went to the page, and it took like 12 seconds to load the page, and I'm like, what is taking so long? This is ridiculous, because I know it's on one of my servers, and my servers are not that bad. Uh, so I realized that I had Core's uh, default poor man's cron, cron running. It's, it's basically, it'll run cron every three hours by default, but you can change that to a different times. What happens, though, is every three hours, it runs cron when some random person visits the site. So you visit the site, and then all of a sudden, that person has to wait for your entire site cron to run. It cleans up tables and deletes things and moves things. So instead of doing that and making that poor 
visitor, whoever that random person happens to be, suffer through it. Uh, use Drush or and or Elijah Cron to run your draw, uh, run your cron jobs, or you can just use a cron tab job on your server. Um, that'll save that poor person. Like for that one person, it's an order of magnitude gain. It's not that big for other people, but you know if you're if you're that person, you'll feel that pain. Uh, so on the back end, there's also a few easy ones too. That we went through some of the Drupal changes. These are some things you can do on your server itself. A lot of people will say. Uh, is one of the first things, like, oh, just switch to Nginx, oh, switch to PHP FPM. If you don't know what these things mean, don't worry at all. This is not that important. Like I said earlier, these are things where a lot of times you might get 1% performance gain. You might get a lot more, but usually it's not that much, especially if you don't know what you're doing. Um, so I would say that that's not that simple. There's a lot of times when using the default way of installing Apache on a server with mod PHP, the way that all the tutorials I've ever seen it, that's not that bad of, of a setup. It's actually very well optimized nowadays. Um, if you have a very big site, that can be really bad. It can be really performance draining. Uh, but for most sites, that's a good setup. So don't, this is not, this first bullet point is not a super high recommendation from me. If you are interested in it, you can get a lot of performance gains from that. But that's not an easy one, I would say. That's why it's in quotes. Uh, the easier win is to add more CPU, add more RAM to your server. Uh, those things will help quite a bit more than than changing your server architecture. Uh, so, you know, cloud computing nowadays is a lot cheaper. So if you're using, like, Linode or DigitalOcean or HostGator or whoever you use, if you just bump up to another plan, you'll usually get a performance benefit from that. Uh, also, th these are some extremely easy wins. So if you're running PHP 5.3, you need to upgrade, like, yesterday. If you're running PHP 5.4, you should have upgraded yesterday. And if you're running PHP 5.5, give yourself a small pat on the back. Active support just ended today for that. So hopefully you're getting to PHP 5.6 soon, which I'm guessing almost nobody in this room is running on 5.6 because most of my sites are still either on 5.3 or 5.4. Uh, it's, a, it's, a it's a strange thing about the PHP community, but we're always a few versions behind. Uh, but one of the biggest performance gains you can get is, especially for on 5.3, if you just upgrade to 5.5, you'll, I guarantee you'll get at least 5 to 10% better performance on any particular page load and a lot better memory usage. So you'll have the same resources on your server and be able to serve more people faster. Uh, there's a lot of little performance improvements between 5.3 to 5.4 and 5.4 to 5.5. And also, um, in 5.3 and 5.4, we had APC cache, which would cache all your Drupal code in memory so it's a lot faster. In 5.5 plus, it's called opcache now, uh, but it's the same thing. It basically takes all of Drupal's code, which Drupal has hundreds of files to load, and it puts it all into memory and optimizes it so that it can load quicker and and uh, punch through all your all your uh, processing on the back end. You want to make sure that the opcache can hold all your code. If it can't, then what happens is every time you load the page, it'll flush out all the cache and then rebuild all the cache. And we all know from building Drupal <coughs> caches. It's not a very efficient thing to do. Uh, so there's a function called opcache get status. Go to one of your live sites, run that command on it, and check the array that comes back. It'll tell you how much memory is being used. And if you have less than 15 or 20% free, you need to increase the opcache memory. Uh, if you're still on an older version of PHP, you can do the same thing using some AP APC functions. Um, also, in MySQL, there's one I, I don't focus on tuning little parameters because usually that's the last thing you do after all these other things. Uh, but there is one parameter that's big, uh, very important, is the NODB buffer size. Uh, you want to make sure that if you, if you can, make sure that this is at least 1.5 times bigger than your database. If you have many databases, you might not be able to do that. But if you have one big database on a server, make sure this is 1.5 times larger. Then MySQL can typically load your entire database in the RAM. There's some exceptions to that, but for most sites, uh, especially if you're mostly anonymous traffic and read-only stuff, uh, that's going to make a, a big difference if it's not in there. Also, enable the slow query log and take a glance at it every now and then. Um, most sites don't have big issues, but sometimes the biggest issues can be a slow query that takes five seconds to, to, to run, and that will take down your site uh, when somebody starts hitting that page. <coughs> so. Those were a lot of back-end things and some Drupal things, but there's also um, what I've found with, with a lot of sites, especially the more, the more advanced, I won't say advanced, 
the more complicated a site gets from a user perspective, the more things and WYSI features are all over the place, the more the front-end performance becomes uh, dominant. Uh, and, and you can get better wins by doing these things. Uh, so a lot of sites nowadays have more image resources than anything else on them. Uh, whether that's a good thing or not is debatable. I, I tend to the not side of that. You know, one, one well-optimized image can be better than a rotator with 75 images in it, that kind of thing. Uh, but no matter what, if you have images on your site, make sure that you compress them well so whoever your content people are, if they're doing images, make sure they're optimizing them somehow or optimize them server-side. Um, also, use image styles. Uh, use the image resize module if you have people embedding large images. Try to remove as many images from a page as you can. Uh, and also, there's a, there's a module for Drupal called Lazy Loader, I think. Uh, that lets you, if you have a page like a gallery page with dozens of pictures, use that so that anything below the scroll area on the screen doesn't get loaded until you scroll down. That can save a lot of time. Um, also, using a CDN is a good way to quickly add a good benefit, like especially if your site is distributed around different places. If people are visiting from both coasts and things like that, it's better to use a CDN than to have one server in the middle of the country that serves them both poorly. You can have a CDN with servers right next to those people, and it does make a difference. Uh, it makes more than 100 milliseconds difference coast to coast, uh, which, as I said earlier, that affects your bottom line if you're selling things uh, or if you do anything else that your website is essential to your business. Um, also, use the tools I mentioned earlier, GT Metrics and all them. Um, they, they give you a list of, like, here's your ranking and, and gives you a grade at the end. Uh, a lot of those things, like, it'll say, like, your e-tags are configured poorly or your expires header's wrong. Those things take, like, 30 seconds to fix, and they do make a small performance uh, impact. And the cool thing is when you run it again, then you get, like, a 90% instead of an 86%, and you feel even better, uh, especially when the little meter turns green instead of orange. Um, another one that uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but every time you add an integration to your site, like embed a YouTube video, put a Facebook like button, uh, put a little news ticker or something, all those little embeds add a lot of overhead. And in fact, from my experience, the, uh, these kind of things, like when you embed just e even a little tracker, like an ad tracker for, for Google or even Google Analytics, these sometimes are the worst offenders for performance on the front end page load. Uh, out of anything you could do. You could compress your CSS and compress your JavaScript and make everything on your site load in like 10 or 20 milliseconds, and then you could put Google Analytics on and you have another 100 milliseconds. So Google Analytics all of a sudden adds 10 times as much page load time as all your resources. So be careful and think very hard about what integrations you're going to use. Uh, so especially things like social widgets and embedded videos and things like that, um, any ads... Um, you know, a lot of people don't like ads anyway, so really think about what is the value of what you're adding to the site. Is it adding to the end user experience so much that you're willing to abandon a percentage of your user base just because it makes the page load slower? Also, iframing things, be careful with that. Uh, especially if, uh, and there's, there's also situations where that content can make your site more vulnerable security-wise and load slower or not load at all if, if, there's, if the site that you're embedding is down, that kind of thing. So uh, I ran through all the different things that we need to do, all the, the, the idea of how we're going to plan this out, and, um, and let's spend some time on Apache configs. No, we're not going to do that. Uh, as I said, you know, and that, that's how I started doing performance too. I would start by going into all the config command line things, and I, I'd go in and edit a file and be like, wow, this is great. I, can, I, I see this little graph had a little dip right there. You know, it's, that's not really worthwhile. So we're going to focus on the big wins first. Uh, so we're going to follow through with the plan that we just had. Um, for this particular site, since I'm not going to load it over the web, I've learned many times don't rely on Wi-Fi at a conference, and I was reminded of that this morning when I couldn't connect. Uh, on a local network connection, we want the home page to load in less than one second for an anonymous user. And for authenticated users, we want it to load in less than two seconds. So we give a little leeway there since, you know, for an authenticated user, you're bootstrapping Drupal and doing everything, but we can get it, get it faster for anonymous users. And we have a couple of assumptions coming into this plan. Not every site is the same way as this site is, but for this site, it's mostly anonymous traffic, so that's our focus. 
and most of these people are going to be loading the site on desktop computers, uh, and probably most of them are in St. Louis or somewhere thereabouts. So we're not going to be worried as much on regional problems or on, uh, on mobile performance. Uh, but if, if you are, then you're going to have to worry about a couple different things a little differently than we will in this plan. So I have a demo site set up, and let's take a look at it really quick. So I have HP Drupal.dev, and this is running on a virtual machine on my desktop. It's running on Drupal VM, uh, which is a pretty good, solid Drupal uh, virtual machine that you can download and, and install. And let me actually make a new window so you can see how it loads. So if I go here, you can see it took you know, three seconds, three and a half seconds, and it just finished loading. Uh, so I'll show you in Chrome. Actually, let me, I'll show you the slide first, which has a little diagram so it's easier to see. Uh, in Chrome, this is how I normally, like, this is a good baseline to start with. <coughs> Open up the Chrome developer tools, which uh, there's instructions over here, uh, and then go to the network tab, and then down at the bottom, if you refresh the page, it'll give you some important numbers. So it gives you the load time of the page, DOM content loaded means when all the content was there and ready to render, uh, and then there's, it also gives you a little graph here of, of all the resources on your page and shows you um, how long it took to load each one and, and how long it took for everything. So that's what I usually start with. And oops, I'm going to exit it. And if I look at this site, HP Drupal, uh, and go to the network tab, and I'll disable the cache. If I load this right now, you can see it's sitting here waiting, waiting. This is all Drupal time. And then it loads everything. So let's see what's going on. First, there's almost four seconds spent waiting for Drupal. Who knows what it's doing? Um, and then it loads all these different resources. So a bunch of CSS files first. We're still loading CSS files. Uh, and then there's some JavaScript and then a bunch of images. And then all of a sudden, what's all this stuff? You know, there's looks like there's something from Reddit. And there's something from Facebook, and there's something from YouTube, some sort of player. So there's there's a lot going on here, and, and you can see this graph over here shows uh, we actually loaded our site stuff in about four seconds, and then we started hitting a bunch of external stuff around four and a half seconds, and then there were about two and a half seconds spent downloading a bunch of external stuff and loading it before finally, after about seven seconds, the page loaded. So we're pretty far off our goal right now. We want to get it to load in less than two seconds. Uh, so first of all, let's take a quick look at the page and see. It looks like there's a YouTube video over here. That could be nice if, if, you're, if this website is demonstrating funny YouTube videos. That might be an essential feature. Uh, then there's this social widget over here that's loading from Reddit. Uh, there's a bunch of content over here that's in a <coughs> It looks like it's in a view. Uh, there's a listing of recent comments a block showing how many people are online right now. Nobody's there. And then there's a couple buttons. Now the interesting thing is, immediately, like if you're looking at this page from a user end user perspective, it looks like this is a site that's giving you a list of news or something like that, and then a funny video. Like That seems to be the main functionality. So really, thinking about it, this, this section here, is it worth having whatever that trade-off is, which seems like it might be a pretty big one, to load in all this external content? And then additionally, to have these buttons down here, which basically do nothing, and yet on almost every site that I see nowadays, it's like, we have to socialize our site. Let's throw these buttons everywhere. These buttons are actually taking like a second or two of time out of your end user experience. The page will still load fine, but it still takes some time, takes some bandwidth, and is it really worth it? Uh, so let's take a look at what we can do. Uh, we also want to do another quick benchmark. So. So that was the front end benchmark. Right now we're at seven seconds. It takes about four seconds to load the, the back end stuff and then three seconds more to render everything on the front end. Uh, so we also want to test uh, just the back end, basically. We don't want to test just the front end stuff. So there's a couple different ways that I usually do with testing for this. Uh, the first one is you can use Drush to actually load the, load the item from, from Drupal as Drupal would load it. And that way you're not looking at your web server you're not looking at your browser. You're just looking at raw Drupal and PHP performance on your, on your system. Uh, so if I take, let's grab this command. Actually, I have it here. So if I take this command, I can time the front page 
Uh, this is just using Drush. It's running some P through Drush on the site. If I run it, it should give me a value. Uh, so it's saying it takes about five seconds, but when you're doing performance stuff, you want to run it at least three or four times if you can more and average them out. So the second time you can see it only took two seconds. Third time, two seconds. So obviously there's something that's cached somewhere. I don't know where it is. That's irrelevant at this point uh, since it's, we're far away from our mark. But it looks like it takes about two seconds to do the backend stuff. This uh, We're basically loading through Drupal, only using the backend, and that takes two seconds, give or take. Uh, and then there's also, uh, you can use a tool like Apache Bench or WRK, which is on most systems you have to download and install it separately. Like if you use Homebrew, it's brew install WRK. Um, but this will test a little bit more like a few people hitting the site at the same time uh, and loading the page. So it'll actually test Apache as well, but it's not going to render stuff on the front end. So it's another good test for the back end. So let's run it. Uh, and this is going to run, the options that I have are it's using two threads, so it's like two people uh, with four concurrent connections, so it's kind of sort of simulating a real-world browser scenario. Um, I could go into a lot more of how Apache Bench and <coughs> WRK and JMeter work, but this is a pretty good baseline. And then it's going to run for 30 seconds and load as many pages as it can and then give us the, the uh, results from that loading. Yeah. Does it crawl the links on your site to try different pages, or does it just hit the same page over and over? Yeah, for, for WRK, you're just passing it. I'm passing it the home page here, drupal.hbdrupal.dev. Um, JMeter, you can do a little bit more of that more easily. I don't With WRK, I think you just pass it one URL, and it does that. And Apache Bench is similar. Um, but this is just to see a really simple overview of, of how our site can perform. So it looks like it takes two seconds or so, like we saw with Drush, to, uh, to load a page. Um, and it looks like the maximum request per second we can get. So we can serve two people per second, which isn't the end of the world. You know, it's, it's, it's not, if you're a pretty small site, two people per second, per second is not bad. But if you had a, if your link got on Reddit or something like that, you're not going to be able to serve traffic like that. Um, so we have we want to be able to scale a little bit too. And while this presentation is not about scalability, performance and scalability go a little bit hand in hand. I'll talk about that later. But we're not at a very good place right now. So let me I have a little table summarizing where we are. So right now we're we're about here. Um, and the load I had seven seconds, but if I go in here, and, whoops, and if I refresh. A couple times you'll see that the average load is more like four seconds. Um, so refresh. And you'll see it's like four seconds. It takes about one, one and a half seconds to get the content loaded, and then four seconds total to get everything loaded. So it's, it's not a horrible place. I've seen a lot of sites way worse than this. So we're already not terrible, terrible. Uh, but I think we can do a lot better. Uh, especially in this last regard, the, we can only serve two requests per second. That's not that's not all that good. So, uh, one thing that we want to look at is there's. It seems there's the. I have a little delta there. Um, there's a large delta between the back end and the front end. So the back end loads in like one to two seconds. The front end for the full render takes four seconds or so. So it's almost double the time after you've loaded everything from the server. It takes almost twice that time to finish rendering it. Uh, so there's some, some issues there. Probably those social integrations, uh, you know, loading all those extra things. There's also a pretty long time to first byte. It, for anonymous traffic, you should be pretty quick. Even if your server was in China, which is like 300 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds away, you should have a shorter time to first byte than one whole second, in this case 1.4 seconds. That means Drupal's spending way too much time doing something. I don't know what it is. Uh, and then also, um, with two, two requests per second, I say, this site will scale poorly, just like uh, Indiana Jones chose poorly. So you're, you're not going to be able to serve up much traffic. So one of the things that a lot of people would do immediately is add some sort of caching. And that's not that bad, but you have to be careful doing that. Uh, you don't want to put lipstick on a pig. In this case, the pig is Drupal. Uh, you don't want to take a bad site and just slather it up with a little caching and hope for the best. You want to fix the underlying problems because they can also cause caching to not be that good. Um, and I would say caches should make what's already decent a lot better. So you can make something that's fast, super fast, 
but it's not as easy to make something horribly slow decently fast. Um, but you still want to stop the bleeding first, so a lot of times the first thing you would do is add a cache. Um, so let's focus on the easy wins. So let's take a look first. I'm going to log into the site, and let's just take out those social buttons. Uh, HP Drupal. Let's quickly, this is a panel on the home page. And those social buttons are just dumb. I don't care about them. Let's get rid of them. Share buttons. Of course, I got approval from the content team. They're OK with this. Uh, approval. Yes. All right, so I took that out. And also, I want to take a quick look. I wonder if any of these are cached. Because caching, it looks like nothing is cached here. So let's, let's add a little caching to these, because even if, uh, even if you do need timely updated content, usually five or 10 minute caches are not that bad. So let's make a five, five minute cache for this. And the search form, we'll leave that. Uh, the YouTube embed, that I talked to the content team, it doesn't change except for once a day. And it should be cleared correctly whenever they update it. So let's do, let's do like an hour. Save. Uh, and then they also said that this Reddit thing is not absolutely necessary. I argued with them that it's adding twice the front end load time, and they said, okay, fine. So we'll take that out too. Uh, and then this popular content, uh, it's below the fold, so it's not quite as important. So we can cache that for a while too. We'll give it 15 minutes. And recent comments, same thing as the popular content. Let's cache it for 15 minutes. And who's online? That's a little more important for this site because it's a community site. Uh, so we do want to add some caching, but we want to keep it lower so that uh, people see who's online a little more timely. So we'll give it a three minute cache. Save that. And let's save this front page. All right, so we've done that. There's a few front-end changes there. Let's also take a quick look at the performance page. So I mentioned earlier, one of the quickest big wins is to make sure that you have anonymous page caching. And look at this, it's not turned on here. So let's turn that on. Uh, and we'll cache the blocks. Uh, oh, and look at this, they didn't, they didn't turn on CSS. Whoever developed this site, they obviously don't know the basics. So basically, almost every Drupal 7 site should have all this on at a very bare minimum. So just doing that, let's go back and let's go ahead and rerun some of these performance benchmarks. Uh, first of all, uh, let's open up Chrome Developer Tools, Network tab, and load it. So that's interesting. 17 milliseconds to load the, the initial page. And, and uh, it looks like our full page load is already at our target without doing anything else. Um, you know, some people in this audience will laugh, but those few changes that I just made, probably 70% of the sites I work on in my lifetime, they don't do those changes, and they lose out on that huge gain. Um, so already we've, we've already hit our goal, but we have a lot that we can do um, in the next minute uh, to improve things even more. Um, so we've already hit that goal. Let's check the back end, because obviously this is now Drupal's caching this page, so that's why it's, it's so much faster. So let's rerun this benchmark on the back end. See what's going on there. So that's interesting. It's still pretty long. That makes me suspicious. Whenever a back end takes more than a second or two, um, there's probably something in the code that, that we could fix. I don't know if we'll get time to fix anything in code, but there's probably a slow query or something going on there. So if you ever see that the back end takes forever to load, but your front end uh, in like your end user cached content load is as fast, then that's that's reason to investigate further. Uh, but let's also take a look at uh, WRK and see how we're doing in terms of handling load. So I'm going to do the same test for 30 seconds and see how many pages can load in 30 seconds. And it'll give us our, our average statistics. And I don't think that we'll have time to get into the back end code stuff. But just as a hint, there is a slow query. Um, it's the developers on the site were not very good. They added a slow query that takes like a second. And they also added a call to google.com that loads when your page loads. So I'll have to discipline the, the programmer later. 
Um, but just doing that change, now we can serve 352 requests per second. And if we did this again, it'd probably go up a little bit as things are cached. Um, and we're, we're able to serve a decent amount of traffic at this point for the home page here. Uh, so if I go back here, uh, a little bit of adjustment, and now we're, we're down to getting things loaded in milliseconds instead of seconds. And uh, these numbers actually were after I fixed those two little code problems. Um, so these numbers are a little lower than, than uh, what we just saw, but they're close. And also we're able to serve a lot more traffic uh, because we can serve hundreds of users per second instead of one or two people per second. And then once you get things cached, like th this is more for anonymous users, but we can talk, well, not today, but we can talk later about uh, working on, uh, on sites where there's more authenticated traffic. Once you get things cached well, and once you fix your backend problems, throwing on top something like Varnish gives you all of a sudden a huge additional win. So I actually have Varnish running. Drupal VM includes Varnish by default, uh, so it's easy to enable. It has a good Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 configuration. So Varnish is running on the same server on port 81. And let's see what happens when we load Varnish. So let me, let me actually close and reopen the window. And open this. If I go to HP Drupal port 81. So let's see how the page loads. So the page loads in three milliseconds now through Varnish, if I take that off. Now Varnish is also able to do everything without even touching the web server at all and the page is loading in two milliseconds. So basically with Varnish or Nginx or some other caching layer, you can get your site to load in an instant, and really the, the main determining factor is how far is the person from your server. So that's where using a CDN can help even more for certain sites. But if most of your users are in the same city as your server, you could have people loading your page in two or three milliseconds, no problem. Um, usually a little more than that because ISPs like Charter are not that great. Uh, but um, now we're loading the page, the, the whole back end loads in about 140 milliseconds, and the whole thing loads in, in almost half a second. And if we run the same <coughs> test again, but on port 81 with Varnish, let's see how Varnish can handle our uh, traffic. Any questions while this is running? Just about finished. No, nothing. There's one. So I use Google Analytics on every site, mm -hmm. uh, and you just told me that that's causing my websites to go slow. Yeah. I said it's. I said it's a. I guess I wasn't as clear. It's. It's always a performance versus the value it gives you. So I actually have debated very much about this for certain things. Like, there's certain sites I have where I do like that traffic analytics data, but. When I think about it, it's really not that important to me. Would I change anything I'm doing on the site? Probably not. It's like a blog for a parish or a blog for some whatever. Certain things you don't need that data, so why not just take that out and then you still have your web server logs. You know, If you really, really need to see how many people visited a page, you can get the data. But if it's not that valuable, take that out. You know, But for a lot of sites, you, you will need certain services. But what I'm saying more is for each one of them, you need to do that, that value proposition how much value am I getting for this particular integration? You know, it, like that YouTube embed is important. You know, the, the whole site is focused on it, so we need to keep it. But we should know that this is going to cause a performance impact. So you want to balance that with all these different integrations. So now with Varnish, we're seeing almost 4,000 requests per second, so yet another order of magnitude increase in the scalability of this website, the ability to load it fast for lots and lots of people. And you're seeing, whereas with Drupal and Apache, it took about 11 milliseconds to load a page. And with Varnish, on average, it takes about one millisecond to load in a page. Uh, so that's, that's quite a big leap. And uh, it's, if you have a site that gets a lot of traffic using Varnish uh, or Nginx for caching, <coughs> is worth the small investment in time to get it set up and running well, by, for sure. So let me pop back here. And you can see uh, now we're loading pages in less than less than 100 milliseconds, usually like one or two milliseconds. Uh, the back-end response is still the same. Varnish is not going to fix that, so there's other things you need to do to fix your back-end. Um, but we're seeing a huge, huge, huge increase in the amount of traffic we can serve. So this little VM running on my MacBook 
could serve most sites under a Reddit or Slashdot or Hacker News or whatever kind of social load that you want to throw at the site. Um, so really quick, my time is up, but, uh, but here are some other, other things that you need to keep in mind. High performance isn't just about getting the page to the user quickly. You want to make sure the page is going to get to the user, so you need to make sure your site's up. So it's good to monitor that, make sure that your site is actually running. Um, so there's different server uh, monitoring tools out there that you, you might or might not uh, judge to be worth your money. Uh, some of them are free, some of them are more expensive. You also need to keep in mind high availability depending on what kind of site you're running. You might want to have multiple servers as redundancy. You might want to have uh, multiple database servers or multiple web servers depending on what kind of things you need to do. Uh, and as I said earlier, user experience is just as important as performance in my opinion. It's horrible to have a slow website that's hard to use, but it's almost as bad to have a fast website <coughs> that's hard to use. If you have a slow website that's easy to use, people might still use it. But if you have a fast website that's hard to use, it doesn't make a difference. So focus on your usability as part of your performance plan. And finally, like I said, this book basically is this presentation, but in book form, which is much better and has a lot of good stuff. This book is already was published like a year or two ago, or like a year ago. It already has a couple things that are a little dated with Drupal 8, so if you're focusing on Drupal 8 soon, um, wait for the second edition of this book. Uh, also, the Drupal VM is a VM that I maintain for a Mac, and you can also run it in the cloud on DigitalOcean or wherever. Uh, it has pretty much all the performance things that I've mentioned here already checked off, plus some more, uh, and it includes varnish and all this different stuff. So uh, that's a nice way to see how so you can see how I do things, basically, and then apply whatever you want to your own servers. And then I have a book, like I said. I think there's a link. No, this might be. No, there's a link somewhere. I'll tweet it or something. If you want the book, 50% off. I'll, I'll tweet out the link later. Uh, but that's all I have. So thank you.